Welcome to issue 58 of the PlayStation Underground. In this issue, we go behind the scenes at Electronic Arts LA to talk to the development team behind Medal of Honor Frontline. You Star Wars fans will enjoy our footage and interviews from our trip up to LucasArts to check out the sequel to Starfighter. In the vault, you can try your hand at hot new game demos like Tiger Woods PGA Tour 2002, Sky Gunner, and Mr. Mosquito. You get all this, plus cool moves, downloads, and more. Back in 1997, legendary director Steven Spielberg charted a new course for video games when he met with a team from DreamWorks Interactive. Spielberg actually has had a very strong influence, particularly from the beginning. He was actually the spark of Medal of Honor, and he was like, I'm working on this movie called Private Ryan, and I've been playing Goldeneye a lot. So, you know, why don't you guys do War II Goldeneye? And, you know, it started from there. That was the beginning of the wildly successful game called Medal of Honor. Since then, the team has produced three games in the series. Now, working under the umbrella of Electronic Arts, they've finished the first PlayStation 2 title in the series, Medal of Honor Frontline. Basically, the complete scope of Medal of Honor Frontline is one complete storyline, and it takes place between the third and fourth mission of the original Medal of Honor. You resume the role of Jimmy Patterson, and the general goal, I guess you could say, of Frontline is you will steal a prototype jet known as the Ho-9 fighter. One of the keys to the success of the Medal of Honor series has been its amazing realism. That even applies to the storylines. The Ho-9 was an amazing piece of machinery that was completely out of the league of anything else that was there. It was potentially a weapon that could have turned the tide of the war. And it's basically a flying wing. It looks like a stealth bomber. You'd be surprised at some of the technology that came out of World War II that just seems so far-fetched. While our scenario on Frontline is fictitious, it actually was captured at the end of the war and is now seeing restoration so that it can be included in the Smithsonian exhibit. In addition to the Ho-9, every detail in Medal of Honor Frontline is meticulously researched. I think that people definitely get a feel for what it was like to fight in those locations. We do an extensive amount of research, both here on site through video and book, and normal research means God love the internet. We just went through the internet and just like just kept typing in various things we were looking for and there's a lot of enthusiasts out there who collect authentic items and they'd have these photographs that just gave us a, a huge wealth of reference material that we can look at and say oh that's what it should look like when it's not new but weathered and worn. We wanted to give them a little bit of like grit to them. Watching movies we get ideas like the whole Nijmegen Bridge scenario is loosely based off of some stuff from A Bridge Too Far. There's a team of climbers who are rogues who go around and illegally climb structures and take pictures of it during their escapades. So the pictures that he took while he was doing this were really important to me because they're from the undercarriage of the bridge where no pictures are of any of the detail under there. And a lot of the gameplay in this level takes place underneath the bridge, so I needed really good reference. Jimmy is dropped into Holland with two other comrades. That whole environment in the Dutch pasture is based on a trip that my art director took to Holland. And he visited a number of museums and took over 1,200 photographs. And they ranged from the architecture to signage to cobblestone road textures to all sorts of material that once he brings back, our artists can put to use in terms of their textures, our designers can put to use in terms of what's a really interesting building. These textures look awesome. Yeah. <laughs> But this is on my idea. Yeah, he looks... Another way the Medal of Honor team immerses you in the game is by working hard to give each character a unique look. In terms of enemies in Frontline, we run the gamut. We have over 300 different variations of characters in the game. So our goal is that every time you see an enemy, in any given level, they will be different from the other enemies you will see. We've got certain technology that we're using where we will swap meshes between characters and heads between characters and the textures will be different and the characters will be different in terms of what they're wearing and what their pack is in terms of what equipment they're carrying and so on and so forth. We've got guys in boxer shorts running around, we've got guys in bathrobes and smoking jackets and then we tried to see how many ways we can combine the various pieces and come up with even newer pieces out of that so we went for as many different individual characters as we could per level. In 
creating so many unique looks, the team found inspiration from many different places. One of our character designers in designing the faces and the face textures actually designed maquettes and he sculpted these heads. He would take these designs, sculpt them out with a flesh-colored clay and light it and then photograph it and use that as the base. And then from there, once it's mapped on and he's satisfied with the way it works on the three-dimensional mesh, he would go through it and start doing painting on top of it. He would paint in details and things like that. To add a little bit more realism, we actually would photograph various people around the building. Use that for some of the variations in the textures. You know, it's funny, I keep thinking that I'm seeing various people around the building in the game. I think our lead sound guy is throughout the game. Our marketing director, I think, is in the game at certain places. And sometimes, you know, if you're having a bad day with that particular person, go to the game and just start firing away at them. It's really good therapy sometimes, but, uh, but don't tell them that. <laughs> Not only are some of the enemies varied, but some of them actually change throughout the game. There's a chef or a cook that shows up in about four levels. He's just cool because he looks mean and we put him through his paces through the game, not just with gameplay, but each time you see him, there's a little bit more damage on him, wear and tear on his costuming, just because we thought, hey, you know, we don't have to reuse the assets from the first time we see him. We can actually give him a torn shirt. We can put a burn flash on his apron. We can give them a black eye. We can do all these things. Unlike many current games, there's no motion capture used in the Medal of Honor series. We made a decision not to use motion capture again in the very first game. And that kind of defined our Medal of Honor tradition. We key animate everything. We hand animate everything. And it's something we take a lot of pride in as well. We do a lot of acting out things. We are constantly seen running around in the hallways with video cameras and with weapons. In fact, we try to be careful if there's a door because people outside could see these guys running around with Tommy guns and all that. In fact, we try to even get a bazooka, but uh, somehow they wouldn't let us have it. I still don't understand why. And the reason is we, just, we get into the skin of the characters. The, all the animators do that. One thing that I pride myself about the way animations are done for Medal of Honor is we use what's called a state-based system of animation. And the whole point is that we animate not just looping animations, but we animate entire mental states. And the cool thing is that you'll see different performances by the same character when played different times. So it's always organic. We don't have the same loop, loop, loop action going on because that's one of the things that totally kills um, animation and games. Perhaps the area where the animation can be seen most is the pub scene. And in Frontline there's a scene where you infiltrate a Nazi pub and there are about 20 Nazis in there. And there's about four or five guys playing cards at the table, there's a couple guys at the bar, there's a couple guards back at the door, there's another table of guys chatting to the side and then there's a piano player. You can't get past the guards at the stairs until you do a little something to get the piano guy to play a little tune and you get all the guys singing and then you can head off to the back of the pub where there's another distraction you cause back there but you're all weaponless at this point. And so there's a little bit of a puzzle there. In your race to capture the Hone 9, you find that you have an enemy who stands above the rest. We're introducing a character named Albrecht von Sturmgeist, and he is the big baddie of the game, and he's the man in charge of the Hone 9's production. And so one of the first things Jimmy is told to do is to track this guy down, and we want him to be a compelling character who's pretty bad and eludes you pretty much till the end of the game. In gameplay, we want to make him feel more like your equal and not like He's so hard that he'll take a bazooka shot to the head, and we really want to get that idea that he's more crafty than he is just, you know, some super badass. <laughs> you're definitely going to have to use both your brains and your arsenal if you're going to help Jimmy Patterson steal the Ho-9 in Medal of Honor Frontline.
This spring, the latest movie in the Star Wars series, Episode 2, Attack of the Clones, will hit movie screens. And as Star Wars fever sweeps the galaxy, the team from LucasArts has given us an intense space combat game that weaves in and out of the latest Star Wars film. Our goal with the storyline in Jedi Starfighter was to tie in the original Starfighter with Episode 2. The game starts 10 years after the original Starfighter ended, picks up with a character that was in Starfighter, Nim, um, adds in a new character uh, who was in Episode 1, Addy Gallia. According to his personality profile, he won't welcome our intervention. She's a strong woman. She uh, was part of the Jedi Council in Episode 1. You would have seen her in the movie. She drives a cool vehicle, and she's pretty fierce. <laughs> Of course, they meet, and Nim's kind of the Han Solo, skeptical of the Jedi religion, all that stuff. A Jedi? Ready? Are you insane? I'm here now. You might as well let me help. Fine, but no lectures and no Jedi mind tricks. And so he and Addy don't get along very well to begin with. And of course, just like Luke and Han, they establish a friendship, and Nim realizes that she's very valuable. He's a pirate. He's unpredictable, and she is by the book. They work out well together. What are the... Oh, you gotta be kidding me. Although Nim is skeptical initially, he starts to believe in the Force when he sees how powerful it is in the hands of a master Jedi. We have four Force powers total, and we dole them out through the, through the game. So you don't have them all at once. You can learn one at a time and kind of master it until you get the next one. We have Force Lightning, and I think that's my personal favorite because if you see a bunch of ships flying in together, when you time it properly, you can take out all of them at the same time, which is pretty awesome. Another fun one is the shield. It acts like a normal shield, but if you get what's called a force clarity, the shield will not only reflect incoming lasers, but it will redirect those lasers to any target of your choice. The third power is force reflex, which slows down the entire game world, but the Jedi stays at the current turning rate and fire rate, so it's supposed to kind of simulate what it would be like if the Jedi had enhanced reflexes. And the last power is Force Shockwave. And that simply emits a large destructive force from the player in a kind of an expanding sphere and just deals major amounts of damage. We're inside. Contact me! Because of the complexity of the Star Wars universe, the game developers at LucasArts have a very close relationship with the creative team at Lucasfilm. Because we're making a game, we need to get access to all of this stuff and shots of scenes and, and characters. They're really good to work with. They do have more involvement than one would expect. They review all of our game designs. Anything that goes into our game, they do take a look at. Even down to making sure that the lightsabers are the right color for the right character. At the same time, George understands really well that making games is inherently different than making movies. And he understands that we need to take these characters and the situations and vehicles and apply them in a slightly different way. The story of the Star Wars prequels is moving closer to the classic Star Wars series. We wondered if the design of the various ships were moving in that direction as well. The first thing that we realized when we saw the design for the Jedi Starfighter is that it is already going toward classic Star Wars. You have the cross between an A-Wing and a Star Destroyer. Basically, it looks like a mini Star Destroyer. Shooting star to new moon. Do you copy? But the lines are starting to be blurred between classic Star Wars and the prequels for sure. I mean, all the designs are saying that. One of the new features of Jedi Starfighter is a two-player mode that can be accessed in every mission. In Starfighter 1, we actually had some hidden two-player modes that you could unlock. With Jedi Starfighter, every single mission can be played either in single-player mode or in two-player mode cooperatively. We wanted to go crazy with that. We wanted to go as far as we possibly could. And a lot of us are big fans of cooperative play, kind of sitting on the couch with your buddy and and the controller over and you're both in the same mission, you're both calling out orders to each other, you know, come get that, you know, blow that up, what are you doing? You could play the first five missions in two player mode and then your friend goes home and you want to keep playing, you just keep playing right on through the game in single player mode and switch back as, as often as you want. Beyond the new two player mode, there's a ton of new bonus levels and materials in the game that should keep fans busy for a long time. We have 10 bonus levels, we have 11 bonus movies. We have nine different bonus craft you can unlock, everything from an X-Wing to Django Fett. We have team commentary video. My initial designs were to have gameplay that go and take you all across the moon and stuff. 
We have a sneak peek at an upcoming game that I probably can't say here. And a bunch of team photos, concept art, all kinds of good stuff. How was that? If you like, I can do it with a little more je ne sais quoi. As you play the game, if you're getting the bonus objectives and you're kicking ass, then you'll unlock all this stuff. So look for the things that would make you feel like you did it really well, like to eliminate all the fighters instead of just enough to finish the mission. Star Wars fans are some of the most hardcore fans in the world. We wondered if their intense interest has any effect on the LucasArts team. I think when you, when you design a game with so many hardcore fans out there, you, you know that you're going to get caught if you don't keep things consistent, if you make errors. They're going to let you know. But it's really nice to have people out there who care so much about it. There's a huge responsibility because people love Star Wars. We love Star Wars as well. And we want to remain true to the spirit of it and just, um, you know, make something really cool. Master Yoda extends his gratitude, Master Gary. Just remember that it's my system. I call the shots. Of course. And may the force be with you. Rated T for Teen. Gather round, all of you who would listen. I have a tale to tell. A story of warriors and kings. A saga of dark magic. A legend of high adventure.
Thank you. 